Good afternoon. Let's get started with the uh, next part of our session. This is the third Juan Carlos Kachanowski Memorial Lecture. Uh, a brief word on Juan Carlos. Juan Carlos was a great Austrian economist and certainly one of the very greatest in the Spanish-speaking world. His important PhD dissertation dealt with the use and abuse of mathematics and economics. He gave a keynote talk at our conference in 2010 and from then up until his passing at the end of 2015, he collaborated closely with us and was instrumental in the growth of our Austrian conference. And it is my pleasure to present to you uh, Agnieszka Płonka from Poland, who will be giving the keynote address in honor of Juan Carlos Kaczanowski. Uh, Agnieszka has an MSc in geophysics. She devotes herself to philosophy and economic education. Uh, attended the Mises University in 2017. She was then ranked in the top 10 for the 2017 Vernon Smith Prize for her essay on propaganda in the framework of the natural law. And in 2020, she was one of the summer research fellows in the Mises Institute in Auburn, Alabama. She's researching psychological manipulations in political philosophies that are based on axiomatically wrong assumptions about a human person. She's also an Institute of Economic Science Europe alumni, contributed to the Free Market Roadshow 2020, and taught economics as a part of the Economics Lessons for the Youth project of the Polish Mises Institute. She's also a member of the Polish Libertarian Association. And her talk is entitled Dialectics from a Method of Argumentation to a Method of Manipulation in Search for the Lost Truth. So, please, Agnieszka. Thank you so much uh, for the kind introduction. Can anyone hear me? Like everyone hear me? Okay, that's great. Um, it's such an honor to be here. And uh, that was kind of a long bio. And the truth is I, I'm a geophysicist that escaped from academia and started doing this because I feel like this matters. And what I'm going to present is uh, a part of, like, let's say, research that my idea for it started with an emotion, actually. And I think we shouldn't dismiss the information that comes from emotions because there are these little indicators that something is wrong before your rational brain can process it. So I thought, hey, I am traumatized in the third generation by socialism, of course. I'm pretty young, it's the third generation, so it's pretty mild, but I can still sense, when I was in the West, in academia, in, in the Netherlands, I could still sense that somehow I cannot explain what my family has been through. There is this wall of impossibility to communicate. And then I realized it's pretty similar to what people experience in toxic situation with controlling bosses, for example. And I was thinking, hey, can we, can we do research on it? Can we do psychological and philosophical research? What's happening to me? What's happening to, to all the people that have been abused in a way? And there is this very fashionable word that is called gaslighting, when somebody who's difficult tries to question your reality. Like, no, I, I didn't steal from you. I didn't kill you. You're just making it up. But, well, he actually did do that. And I just thought that reading about... Uh, Marxian style of dialectics that brings that that seems very similar similar to gaslighting in uh, more one-on-one uh, -on -one situations. So I thought, what happens? You know, like Aristotle called dialectics one of the methods of argumentation, and somehow right now this word is used to manipulate people. So something must have happened in the course of uh, history of philosophy, and some meanings must have changed. So I decided to look into it, and uh, that's how uh, this 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 talk started. That that's how the idea started. So before uh, I talk about uh, how meanings of the word truth 
that we perceive. Of course, the tr truth is the truth. It doesn't change. But how we perceive it in culture, in philosophy, in modern philosophy, what it means in so-called discourse, that changes. So before I run into, into it, I will establish reality. And of course, if there are any relativists in the room, I invite you for the ride. Um, I just uh, want to establish what we are going to like call axiomatic in this talk. So I'm 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 just uh, uh, an exact science person, and I'm, uh, I'm I'm a simple person. I see three A, Aristotle, Aquinas, Ayn Rand, and I say, okay, well, uh, truth is objective, external to us, can be discovered. And we have the principle of non-contradiction by Aquinas. We have A is A by Ayn Rand, and I'm going to stick to that. So one of the axioms throughout this talk will be the notion of objective external truth, and that we shouldn't be, uh, we should be, we should, we should have the humility to realize that we do not decide what is true. Reality does. And another, even maybe even more important axiom. Uh, will be the notion of human person, this anthropology in the theological sense, so to speak. So yes, I did put Ayn Rand and uh, John Paul II, Karol Wojtyla on one slide, and I have very good reason for that. So uh, that axiom says that you are an end in yourself. Like, you are not supposed to be treated as means to achieve, achieve any ends, like you're not a machine, like you're, you're not a little uh, um, thingy in the machine, in the social machine, like you are not to be treated as an object, you are a human being. So you're a subject, not an object. And well, Ayn Rand would uh, formulate this in a sort of negative manner that, well, what, what's not to be done to a human person, like a human person is already uh, has value of uh, themselves and, uh, what went even further, and what I would suggest is a more full formulation of that, is the personalist norm, uh, which was like really uh, explored by John Paul II in his habilitation, when uh, a human person is unique, has transcendent worth, and um, is to be treated as an unique individual, and not in any way be perceived as a part of a blob that we can manipulate or use in social engineering. So those are the two very important assumptions that I will have, and I will show you that when one of these assumptions is lost, bad things happen, okay? So first assumption is uh, objective truth, and the second assumption is human dignity, individual human dignity. So uh, how do we go from here? Like, what's happening today is the truth or human dignity treated appropriately today? Well, I don't think it is. Uh, I don't think it is. We are uh, in some kind of tribalist war. We have uh, people perceiving themselves as part of groups that are hostile to each other. And uh, well, in terms of objective truth, we are very far away from that. Like uh, modern philosophy, especially, mm, what I will show in the like late in that talk can be very polylogist in the sense, like in the Marxist sense, but uh, mutated to fit uh, today's world. Like, well, you think that way because you come from uh, this social class. You think that way just because you are black or white or blue, and that destroys the means of communication. But that destroys also the notion of truth when we say that truth is different for different people. Well, no. So how did this all dissolve? Like, How did uh, reality dissolve in what we are talking about in philosophy? Because uh, I obviously I chose the word dialectics because I think that's a really traceable um, mechanism that, that we can track in 30 minutes. But if we were to talk about the dissolving of truth in philosophy, that would take a maybe a, a semester, so let's just stick with dialectics and see what happens. Um, so I googled uh, dialectics in, 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 uh, in the like, Google uh, image, uh, and I thought, like, okay, will I be any smarter? Will I really know what that is? Um, so I see 
that's from Thesaurus Plus. What are, the, what are other words for dialectics? And uh, this pigeon with uh, beret and uh, bread on his uh, neck is saying that dialectics is also reasoning, argumentation. Russian, I don't know what Russia's nation is. Maybe I should know that. Logic, dialectic, polemics, discussion, debate. Like, wait, 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 what? Um, logical argument, deduction, like all of that can be this, like substituted by the word dialectics? I don't think so. And also, like, why is this pigeon like having a bread around his neck? Like, does he like not, not know how to eat bread because he's like, an academic or something? I, I don't know. Uh, de decolonizing dialectics, that is very trivial. It's like, oh, this white person was hitting the black person on the head, so now we have to change and somebody else will be hit on the head right now and nobody will say, hey, it's probably wrong to hit other people on the head. Like, we don't keep score and we... So, here's the colonizing dialectics, or here, very scary image, dialectics of revolution with Hegel and Marx that we will talk about. Hegel, Marxism, its critics, through a lens of race, class, gender, colonialism. Is there a lens of an individual person there? Is there a lens of reality or of, of truth? No, those are these collectivist blobs, right? Race, gender. So I'm not any smarter. I Google dialectics and I still don't really know what that is. But um, if, you, if you do that, you will see some records that are uh, kind of talking about the uh, antiquity, what Zeno of Elea did and what, Parmil what uh, Aristotle uh, like called dialectics. Then you have something about Hegel. And then you have a little bit of the Marxist insanity. So it's very confusing if you Google dialectics. You still don't really know what that is. And like, I'm not sure I do. Uh, but I think that if Zeno of Elea uh, saw all these records from Google today, he would really be confused because that was not his intention as far as I know. So what happened is that uh, Zeno of Elea had a teacher, Parmenides, and Parmenides argued for unity of being. Uh, he, had, he received some harsh critique. And people were saying, well, hey, no, the, like, we, we, cannot, we cannot have unity of being. Things are different. And um, Zeno of Alea said, well, you know what? You are attacking my teacher. I want to defend Parmenides. And uh, you know, the, the way you argue, uh, your argument can al also be used as against unity of being. So I'm not buying your argument. I will expose some flaws in, in what you are saying. So in that time, debate was still um, carried out to establish existent truth. So they still had that assumption, truth is external. We discuss logically and we see uh, who, 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 is, who is more close to the truth that we do not decide on. And um, Aristotle actually called what Zeno of Elea did, uh, dialectics. And he, he said, well, those are two different methods of argumentation. And only those two methods can arrive at different conclusions from the same premises. But the reason we use uh, dialectics in that sense is to expose some faulty argumentation of your critics. Um, it's not to say that two things are true at the same time. That was never uh, that was never this. And uh, some say, we cannot really prove that it's true. Some say that uh, Zeno of Elea and Parmenides tra uh, traveled to Athens when Socrates was still here. And uh, Zeno actually told Socrates that it was just some kind of provocating way of defending my teacher. And I, uh, but we, we cannot prove that this exchange took place. So, it started with, well, Parmenides, Parmenides arguing for unity of being, and Zeno Evela said, well, you don't really cri critique him right. If existing things are many, there must be like and unlike. So if things are like and unlike, it's a contradiction. And this is a contradiction, so this premise cannot be true. So you see, again, we kind of have this ancient kind of non-contradiction principle. And... Uh, it's still esteemed in a way, like it's still a method of argumentation. Truth is an attribute of logic, so we argue to arrive at the external truth. If there's a contradiction, something is wrong. So that's antiquity. But what happened later is uh, Kant published his critique of pure reason. And um, 
things would still go pretty well if another philosopher didn't write a letter. Um, so Kant used the word dialectics in still kind of this ancient way. So he carved something called thesis antithesis diets that seem to be contradicting each other. For example, the word has a beginning and the word has no beginning, pardon me for the slide. And he would argue that, hey, well, those are two different, like A is not A. The word has a beginning, the word has no beginning. But they, the, the, the notion of word relates to experience. So, and that uh, proposition does not relate to experience. So uh, those are illusions, like both of them are false. So in his argumentation, uh, there are some illusions that, there are some dialectical illusions that we may think are contradictions, but the real reason they're contradictions is that we mix up reason and experience and reason has its uh, limits. So that was the idea of Kant. And now, he would say that it's an illusion because they are not really contradicting each other. If they were contradicting each other, we would have a problem. So in a way, I would say that Kant was still using the esteemed ancient way of, uh, of dialectics. Of, uh, but then what came Fichte. And what Fichte did is say, well, you know what? I really want to be noticed in German philosophy. And uh, Kant has this uh, thesis, antithesis diet. So there is something to be solved. So I will propose a synthesis. But there was really nothing to be resolved. Kant called them in illusions. But uh, Fichte misunderstood him and thought that, hey, let's propose a synthesis. We have to synthesize both uh, A and is not A in one. So right now, the stage was really ready to be taken over by Hegel with what Fichte did. So you have contradictions and you seal them into synthesis. So the thesis, uh, antithesis, synthesis triad is actually Fichte's, it's not Hegel's. But right now we are ready for the first transition and truth kind of loses its meaning. Um, but before I go there, I still have to talk a little bit about unity because any, like dialectics always somehow relates to unity. And um, there was unity in Parmenides' um, exposition back in the ancient times. But what Hegel did with unity and what German idealists did with unity is something far deeper and different. So, um, excuse me, maybe uh, I can use my uh, other presentation so that um, it looks better. Um, I'm sorry about this. Mm. Is that okay? Okay, uh, we'll work on that. So uh, the question is, why did God create the universe? And there was a Christian heresy, a long, uh, an ancient Christian heresy saying that, you know, God is not perfect and he created, universe, he created the universe because he was feeling uneasy. And then there is this creation of God that wants to reunite with God but has to go through this process of perfecting itself to reunite with God. So that's like the theology of process. And that, that was a, a, a non-heretical Christian would tell you that, you know, God created the universe because he loves people, he loves being in relations and out of love and joy. He is perfect and the only way you can be estranged from God is by your moral choices because you have free will. But all those early Christian sects, those Ger German romanticists like Böhme, they would say, um, you know, no, uh, God was not perfect. The uh, Creation is actually also God, and we have to evolve to be reunited with God in one ontological cosmic blob. And the estrangement we feel from God is ontological, like we are God, and we have to realize this. So that's a very dangerous heresy. And, you know, it seems that this question is somehow, you know, out in the 
stratosphere and doesn't affect our lives. But the truth is that the answer to this question will affect your life deeply. And it doesn't matter if you believe in God or not, because that shapes uh, civilization in a way. And note that this was really a deeply anti-individualistic heresy, saying that we are all one and we have to go back to being one God. That's very anti-individualistic and that's kind of like a seed of uh, being against like the first, the second axiom, human dignity and, and, and personalism. So for Hegel, Hegel actually took it to kind of the next level. He pantheized these views and said, well, we have to reunite with the spirit. And there is just like one will of man. And there's one will of man. Man is God. We have to evolve. We have to reunite with the spirit. The Prussian state is the next step of reuniting with the spirit. We all have to think the same. I am the great philosopher. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you think different than me, then, well, I feel uneasy because we are all one. Um, so that's really chilling, like, like that's really deeply disturbing in a way. And if you, uh, Rothbard actually writes brilliantly about this in uh, classical economics in, 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 in his second book. And uh, for P Professor Tucker said that Hegel's conception of freedom is totally turned in a literal sense of the word, right? So uh, you are free when you are one step closer to reuniting with the spirit. So you have to be one with the state and the Prussian state is like on the way of reuniting back with, with the spirit, like the pantheized version of God. So uh, then you are free. So you have to be one with the Prussian state to be free. And the world self, whatever that means, must experience itself as the totality of being, or in Hegel's own words, must elevate itself to a self-comprehending totality. So I am a self-comprehending totality. You all must be me and I must be God. Anything short of this spells alienation and the sorrow of finitude. And like when I read that, I thought, you know, some deeply disturbed people that have narcissistic or sociopathic tendencies, they actually really want others to think like them. And if you are not like them, they perceive it as criticism because they don't like the idea that they are not infinite. So that was deeply disturbing. And Popper actually called Hegel uh, the missing link between Plato and the modern forms of totalitarianism. So right now, not only truth kind of changes its meaning, which I will talk about, but also unity is not some kind of logical play of ancient philosophers. It's actually uh, like deeply disturbing theological concept that we have to be one with everything and there is just one mind. Um, and Hegel was working with this notion of unity in his head and kind of using the dialectics that Fichte gave, gave him. So. What was the change in truth and dialectic? So anything, if anything can be conceived, it has to be one with the totality of being. So Hegel would say that facts are a negation of truth. I'm not sure if I understand German idealism, but I, I think it's like a bubbling soup of facts. And truth is somewhere out there, yeah, an essence that, is, uh, that, that we, cannot achieve, like we cannot access unless we are Hegel. And then, um, in German, that idealism, truth is an attribute of reality, like representing the, the realization of a given essence. So um, it's not an attribute of logic anymore. It's some kind of weird cosmic thing out there. Every conflict is between two rights. See, everybody is right. So how do we even go from there? So we don't have any objective truth anymore. We don't really have human dignity because of that weird concept of unity. So what's going to happen next? Something very, very disturbing. Feuerbach came and uh, mixed it with materialism. And now Mises would say in theory of history that the only salvageable thing in, in the Hegelian system was that it was idealistic. It wasn't linked with experience. It wasn't linked with what we have in, in, in life. But Feuerbach said, hey, let's mix Hegelian dialectics uh, with materialism. So what's going to happen? Like, hey, 
And, and, then, and then Marx said that Feuerbach was the only one who has a serious critical attitude to the Hegelian dialectic and who has made genuine discoveries in this field. Discoveries in this field was that we can basically say anything we want and we can be right anyway. So let's, let's do a totalitarian state, kind of. Um, and how do you mix Hegel's statements that factors are a negation of truth with facts? Does it mean that facts are a negation of facts? And, uh, well, you kind of kill the notion of objective truth altogether here. And you only have your new process theology. But the um, essential mark kind of, of materialism is that, uh, that the, um, I'm looking for this slide. The essential mark of materialism is the paradise, the process theology, it has to realize itself in, in the world that we have now. So we have to achieve paradise on earth. And uh, the, the, the process of history right now, that is the will of the pro pro proletariat, that is the will of the party. We have to be always right, and we can argue that we are always right by the use of dialectics, because hey, if we say that facts are a negation of facts, we can also say that, you know what? Um, yes, I did say that uh, one uh, week before, but now it's not true because it doesn't further the will of the party, and we are achieving this big, concept of paradise. So Hegel plus Marx, that equals the um, Tower of Babel that you can see in Kunsthistorisches Museum. Um, there was actually a quote from Marx from a letter to Engels. It is possible that I shall make a fool of myself, but in that case, one can always get out of it with a little dialectic. I have, of course, so worded my proposition as to be right either way. So he's very open about this. Mm, so, how, what, what really happened with the truth? What really happened with uh, human dignity? Uh, there were this, I would say that there, was this, there were these two transitions. Like, one, there was just an individual man arguing for, um, like, looking for truth for argumentation. But then, th there comes that notion of unity from the Christian heresy, um, and we pantheize it, and there's the spirit and the essence somewhere in the universe, but we don't know what that is. Um, but we only know facts are a negation of logic and truth is an essence somewhere, somewhere out there. But then we mix it with, my, with materialism and we say, you know what? The, re, the, re, the unification with the spirit has to exist in today's world. We will achieve it. Mm. And we arrive at like, the will of the proletariat, which is the will of the party. That is the only true thing in the world because we are leading you in the great process to, 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 to build the Tower of Babel. So first we had truth, but then it kind of dissolved into this idealist essence. And now again, what we, we mix it with materialism, we make the Feuerbach transition and bomb is the will of the party. And you cannot say that it's wrong because we can always say that this is right. And that's basically a quote from Marx. And from the heresy that gold was imperfect and creation has to reunite with God, now we have process of history, and then we have feudalism going into uh, negation of feudalism is capitalism, negation of the negation is communism. And from argumentation to some kind of weird idealistic blob, we get a method of manipulation. So how to see here, there is this exposition, Zeno of Elea, Aristotle, uh, but then we change the meaning of truth. Truth is idealist. Truth is somewhere we don't know where. But there is Hegel saying that being in false and contradictions. But we don't mix it with facts. And then Feuerbach comes, and we arrive at Marx and Engels. Hey, we mixed it with facts, and we arrived at something really weird. Engels, that I dressed up as a clown here, says that geology is just a series of negations of negations. Like, what's up with that? So actually, if you read the dialectics of nature, Engels would see Marx's dialectics everywhere. Like, for example, he picked up the behavior of the magnetic field, saying that, you know, we cut the magnetic, like, we cut the magnet in half, and there is one uh, negative and one positive end of the magnet, and that means that contradictions are evolving in this, di this dialectical process. Like, hey, you know what? The electric field doesn't behave that way, but you had to pick a magnet. And, well, all science has to serve the new philosophy, so you know what, we are very lucky that Schrodinger came after uh, Engels, because if we had Engels, Schrodinger, and Lenin at the same time living, we would say, we would, Lenin would in the end say that, you know what, yeah, these people are dead, but they are also not dead. <laughs> like, th th I think this will happen. So, how to apply a lie to a true world? 
uh, by all encompassing propaganda because there is just one truth. So like you have to be bombarded with this propaganda. So Sir Walter Citrin, a British sociologist, he wrote in I Search for Truth in Russia, that was in 1930s, propaganda is everywhere. There is no escape from it and no challenge to it. There is never any other source from which the worker can learn the other side. And uh, I actually Googled dialectics in the Soviet Union and uh, what I got this central intelligence uh, agency information report uh, saying how this affects the psychology of the Soviet citizen, that somehow he is so bombarded with the dialectic, he would uh, see contradictions as evolving will of the party. Like it's okay uh, that f somehow I can only buy left shoes because that's so that furthers the agenda. It's, uh, you know, it's uh, a, a train wreck in the Soviet Union is good, but somewhere else it is bad. So uh, they were very much molded into to uh, negating any kind of notion of objective truth. So, and, and they were in the end traumatized. So uh, that's, what, uh, that, that's what we learn about Comrade Ivanov in the Central Intelligence uh, Agency, in the CIA report. So um, actually we learned that there is no objective standard of the human behavior. Morality is what serves to destroy the old exploiting society. We do not believe in an eternal morality. That's Lenin addressing the Third Congress of Consomal. So you see there is the um, second axiom here now is thrown out of the window. Human dignity is thrown out of the window because we have to further our agenda. And channeling all this into self-criticism, it's like, hey, you don't agree with the party, but that's a contradiction. So it's a dialectical process, so you really agree with the party. And uh, means of communication are destroyed in that way. You cannot, you cannot argue against anything. Uh, what, uh, what Lenny also wrote is, whoever has not understood the future of contradictions that person is dead to Marxism. I mean, I, I did not understand it, but I am so dead to Marxism, right? Um, so first they came for the truth, and now all meaning is lost. And now I have a question. Imagine that uh, somehow up in space there was a state funded by, for example, Thomas Jefferson, and they sent an intelligence agent to an uh, American campus to write an intelligence report on the psychological state of an American student today. Would that report be any different from the report of the CIA from 1954 on the psychology of the Soviet citizen? And well, yes, maybe yes, maybe no, but I think there will be grave similarities. So, uh, of course, right now viruses mutate, right? And this virus of attacking objective truth also mutated in a way. So now in postmodernism, everything is constructed from language. So we don't even have the notion of contradiction. But uh, I see relativism still like the very, very uh, prominent pop culture. I have to finish. Uh, you know all about, like, you, you know critical race theory, right? That's basically tribalism, uh, people piling up against each other. And again, no notion of objective truth. Like, you are saying this because you are white or black or whatever. Um, Deplatforming, saying that, oh, you only say that because of where you are from. No means of communication. And uh, so, actually, that's a certain journalistic experiment I made. I, I will write about this soon, where I asked... Uh, where uh, at Utrecht University I could tell them about the horrors of communism and then they will say, you know what, we are not going to publish that because it's just because where you're from. That's why you are saying that. That's, that's totally polylogistic. And then uh, they would say that, you know, but there are Marxist professors out there that uh, see the world through the lens of class struggle. So not through the lens of reality, through the lens of class struggle, this collectivist blob. So I, yes, some things in postmodernism are different, but uh, the big thing where you, know, you basically attack the truth, that is still here. And again, if everyone's right, ultimately only the ones with the most guns are right. And we see that today. And I don't think uh, today's world is, 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 is different, that there are some subtleties. But ultimately, you must choose. But choose wisely. Is truth subjective or objective? Is value subjective or objective? You have to pick the right thing is. Because if you don't, we all remember from Indiana Jones, the Holy Grail, this is what happens to you if you don't choose wisely. So if you say, okay, truth is subjective, value is subjective, yeah, you will turn into that. And there is no way around it, you must choose. So which one is gonna be? <laughs> Thank you for your attention. I, um, I was, I'm running late, but. <laughs>
Great. Thank you very much, Agnieszka, for that enlightening tour through dialectics in, in history. I'll uh, forego my natural right, as it were, to put any questions to you and turn it straight over to, to you, the audience. Thank you for, for this very enlightening talk. Um, my question is, how do we combat all of that? Because uh, as you clearly demonstrated, facts and logic uh, are nothing to those uh, programmed NPCs. Uh, non-player characters, and uh, do you really think that just like the tool set we have with only a liberal mindset, uh, if we can ever combat that? Because I don't want Gulags 2.0. Yeah, um, so, so if I understand the question correctly, how do we even communicate with someone who doesn't think about truthful logic, like doesn't think in those, uh, in those terms, and right? It, it was more like, how do we protect our society, our, our values? Yes, so. yes, uh, yes. It's a, it's a, it's, 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 it's difficult. And it's very, it's an important question. When I was at universities, I could, people would tell me, oh, but everybody's right. Oh, like you are not nice. You must be, you must be lonely here because you are not nice. Just because I suggested that truth might be objective. So, but those are like this was the bubble of academia, right? And. Uh, in a way, I would say somehow reality will defend itself, but at what cost? So, like human nature is what it is. You cannot lie about it. If you are like living in a totalitarian system, people will get traumatized because their nature is different than what the what the philosophy says. But uh, is it really at this cost that we want to uh, learn it? Um, I'm not sure how do we defend today's society against it. Form our own institutions, like form a private university <laughs> in Montenegro. <laughs> Go and teach and teach argumentation and uh, don't look at the system. Don't look at, uh, at, at, at Ivy League. Just go out there and you know, throw an event where we will learn how to argue, we will learn rhetoric. Throw an, like go to high school and show them economic calculation on candy like we were doing in, with Mises Institute Poland. Like that's we can, well, what we can do. That's like the uh, groundwork. That, that's what I would say. Yeah, thank you. Excellent talk. Yeah. Um, you drew a great straight line from Hegelian dialectics to a lot of what's going wrong in universities, etc. Uh, and you mentioned Karl Popper. I was just wondering if you ever did a, looked at Karl Popper's um, critique of Hegel uh, in the open society or elsewhere, uh, and uh, what you might be able to say about that, and how uh, perhaps by uh, by looking at uh, at at um, this monster for what it is, if it's possible to uh, defuse it somehow in the minds of students directly at universities. Hmm. I, I'm not sure. I don't think I know. I don't think I know the answer to that. Like what we could do. Um, how, how, like, w like with Karl Popper, we could say, keeping an open society would mean keeping means of communication somehow, right? So we can all argue together. Like we have different mindsets, but we can we can uh, we can all argue together and we could look for the truth. But that all already, that already, uh, if, if you go, if you look at what's happening on the campuses, that already is in a way destroyed. And somebody could use Popper and say, hey, Popperian paradox, you are not tolerant, get out of here. And uh, well, which like, I very much appreciate Karl Popper, but on this one thing, I don't think he was right. So I am afraid that what they are doing now is they could actually use different philosophers and twist their words to further the, their agenda anyway. Uh, okay, uh, thank you. Uh, just a little follow-up uh, mm -hmm. to the Hegel uh, question, and uh, what I'm uh, going to say is uh, more about a little polemic, a really mm -hmm. minor one, uh, than about uh, a question. I hope you're okay with that. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, don't get me wrong here, I am not uh, Hegelian, I just uh, don't believe uh, Hegel was uh, uh, totalitarian, and I uh, also deeply believe uh, that uh, Popper uh, has uh, greatly f misinterpreted uh, and misrepresented uh, Hegel, uh, because, uh, you know, uh, first of all, uh, Hegel uh, always had uh, that uh, triadic 
scheme uh, of, uh, of all things uh, he wrote about, and uh, the same went uh, for his uh, vision of uh, society. So, uh, in a nutshell, uh, in Hegel, uh, we have a threefold structure of uh, society, uh, all elements of it being equally necessary. So, we have uh, family, uh, we have uh, civil society, uh, which is uh, Hegel's uh, peculiar term uh, for free market, uh, and uh, thirdly, we have uh, the state. And uh, most crucially, uh, for Hegel, uh, both uh, lower uh, parties uh, or, or lower uh, elements uh, of uh, the structure, that is uh, family and uh, the free market, uh, must be autonomous vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the state. And now, uh, why did Hegel uh, speak uh, so highly of uh, the Prussian state? Why uh, did he believe that uh, it was uh, the Prussian uh, monarchy uh, that was uh, closest uh, to, uh, to the ideal? Uh, well, uh, simply because uh, he uh, considered uh, the Prussian monarchy uh, to be the most liberal state, uh, that is, uh, the one uh, protecting uh, the autonomy of uh, the family and uh, of uh, the free market uh, to the highest uh, extent, at least uh, as uh, compared uh, to, uh, uh, to its peers, uh, to, uh, to contemporary uh, monarchies. Uh, he expressed uh, that uh, belief, for example, in his uh, letter to uh, Chancellor uh, Hardenberg, uh, and uh, he uh, uh, absolutely praised uh, the reforms, the liberal reforms uh, undertaken uh, by uh, Chancellor Hand, uh, Hardenberg um, and, and Stein, uh, as well as uh, the, uh, let's say, uh, free speech liberalism of uh, the Could you bring uh, your question to a close, so, please? Uh, okay, okay. Uh, th that's uh, precisely the f uh, conclusion. Uh, that uh, was exactly what I wanted to say. Hegel was not a totalitarian. Okay, uh, there are some dangers, uh, there are some bad seeds uh, in uh, his dialectics, but still his politics was by no means totalitarian. Thank you. Yeah, well, I'm happy there are philosophers in the room because I only had relativity at school. I didn't have relativism, so thank you, Norbert. Um, yes, I did pick like one little chunk of like one little process that was going on here. So I was only looking at um, the dangers of dialectic itself, and, and mostly I was very into uh, into researching that unity and that. Uh, that idea, but um, I'm very happy I have philosophers in the room, like um, a number of philosophers, thank you for that. And uh, I would personally, I would, I'm not sure if I would want to be with Hegel in the room because he seemed a bit narcissistic, but that's just my thing. We get one more very quick question, if there is one. Or we can break early, one minute early, for a 20-minute coffee break out there in the lobby. Uh, join me in thanking Agnieszka Płonka once more, please. <laughs>